Okay, now this is a story I'm pretty sure that I have shared before. I'm not 100% sure, but it's a story that I always think of whenever we talk about John the Baptist. Now, it feels like yesterday, but it was many years ago. I was heading to Winston-Salem to visit my mom, and I had been on the road all day, and I was really tired. On the way home, there is a Shell gas station less than a mile from my mom's home, and I decided to go ahead and fill up the gas tank before getting to her place and just fall right to sleep. And then something strange happened. As I was pumping the gas, all of a sudden, I heard a voice. Hey, pump number two, how are you? I look around. No one was there. And I thought I must be really tired. But then I heard it again. Hey, pump number two, how are you? I looked around. I looked up. And I finally said, okay. And the voice said, good, good. And that was it. What was that? The next morning, I was having breakfast with my mom. And I still can't believe I asked her this question. I said, Mom, does the gas pump talk to you? (laughs) Now, to my relief and surprise, she said, Oh, you mean the Shell gas station? Sure. So I thought, well, great. We we both are going to be uh, considered strange after this. But what happened was a few days passed, and wouldn't you know it, I really wanted to hear that voice again. And I was ready to take my car, my mom's car, my sister's car, just anybody's car to go back to the gas station. And I can't believe I said this out loud. I even texted it. I said, hey, if anyone needs gas, let me know. Now, not only did I want to hear that voice again, I needed to hear that voice again. Now I'll tell you how that ends. But first, the need to hear a particular voice is one of the themes in our gospel lesson. When John appears on the scene, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, have been waiting a long time for a voice, a particular voice, that voice being the voice of God. In the past, God's voice was transmitted through the prophets. This is how Israel heard God. And the voice showed that there was a relationship between God and the people. By the time John appears, and with exile, slavery, destruction of the temple, living under foreign rule, there was a common belief among the Jewish people that it had been 400 years since God had spoken to them. 400 years. The voice of God had gone silent. How long must we suffer? How long must we wait, O Lord? The voice of God represented God's reply to these famous words that we see often in Psalms. So the people not only wanted to hear God's voice, they needed to hear God's voice. They were waiting for a sign, a particular sign that would signal God is coming. The struggle faced by the Jewish people is one that's very familiar to us. Think about the times in our lives where we experienced hardships And we long to hear God's voice of comfort. I think of, in particular, these holiday seasons, especially Christmas. You may have heard of things like a blue Christmas. We must remember that holidays are not always good times for everyone. That there are people that when a holiday comes, it brings up bad memories, bad moments. Or it reminds them of someone who has passed on, who has passed away, someone that has left a void in their life. Or think about times in our struggle where we started to listen to false prophets who promised much but 
produced very little. Those moments, those are the moments when we start wanting and needing to hear God's voice. What I have learned is that God's voice is not silent. God's voice is never on mute. God is always speaking. Now for the Jewish people, God is speaking through John. Now John could have said, hey, I've got a message from God. But other so-called prophets had said the same thing. So the people were used to that. Instead, John says, make straight the way of the Lord. Make straight the way of the Lord. Now, if you have ever seen a cop show or a movie, and they have someone wearing a wire to catch the bad guys, to get the proof that they need, that person will say a word or a phrase that signals the police to swoop in and make an arrest. Matt, is that pretty close to... Okay, good. It was on a cop. It was on Law and Order, so I just assumed it was true, right? So, the phrase "Make straight the way of the Lord" was a signal. Back then, there were very few surfaced, artificially made roads. The few that were available were originally built by the king, for the use of the king. The people called it the king's highway. Before the king was due to arrive in any area, a message was sent out to the people. And that message, make straight the way of the king, prepare the way of the king. In other words, get the king's road cleaned and repaired before the king's journey. That is the phrase John uses. That is the signal for the people that not just any king, but the king, the one who God promised the Jewish people was on his way and he was coming soon. So how were the people to prepare for the king's coming? How were they to listen and to hear John's words? The answer is repent. Repent. Now, people can be very defensive when it comes to repentance. For a long time, I did not like the word because when I went to NC State University, we had a number of brickyard preachers who would come to campus and point at everyone and call everybody a sinner, except themselves, of course, right? And that left a bad taste in my mouth because it sounds so much like repent or else. And it was also a label. If you told someone to repent, that obviously meant that person was bad, was a sinner, was beyond God's love. So, over time, I have learned that repent is a beautiful word. The Greek word for repent means to change one's mind. But it involves more than just thinking in a different way. It means to change one's life and return to begin a new relationship with God. We sometimes believe that to repent is to confess what we have done wrong and that there is no follow-up. There is no second act. That is why we want to praise and celebrate when we're together. We want happy songs. We want happy hymns rather than focus on repenting. We want to keep those good vibes going. We don't want to talk about the bad things that we have done. When we face guilt, we have a hard time thinking that anything good will come from it. But repentance has always been about the mercy that follows. Have any of you, when you were young, broke something that was really expensive? I was going to ask you to raise your hands so that the cameras can point you out, but I remember specifically one young person who will remain nameless who was told over and over again, do not throw the football in the living room because the beautiful and expensive lamp is right there. Do not throw the football. 
Well, guess what I did? Well, guess what he did? <laughs> you guessed it. Threw the football, and the lamp broke. I remember how scared I was because of what I did. And I feared the worst. And I did what any smart nine-year-old would do at the time. I ran to my room, closed my door, turned off the lights, and hid under the bed. My mom wouldn't be able to find me. But she did. And as she came into the room and saw me, I started to cry because I felt so bad for disobeying her and breaking this expensive lamp. But my mom did something that I'll never forget. My mom gave me that mom look first, the mom look. But then she held me. She held me tight. And in that hug, I heard my mom's love for me. And it was not just her love. It was God loving me through her hug. It was God's voice talking to me and hugging me. It was a voice that said that God was always there through the good and the bad. One moment I was afraid and the next moment I felt strong. When we hear God's voice and God is showing us and giving us the proof that we asked for that God was always here and that God loves us, we too can become strong. Now, a little special early Christmas gift for all of you, a special did you know that will wow your friends or maybe scare them. But it doubles also as a shout out to my mom, the former English teacher. The first verse from our psalm, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. The writer describes Zion as like one's dreaming. This, this is what I told my mom. Mom, this is a plural participle. What do you think about that, mom? And she says, I have no idea what that is. I'm like, okay, all right, great. Well, it comes from a verb which is most often translated from Hebrew as dream. But that verb has another underlying meaning. It means to become strong. This is the meaning that the first century Greek Bible translators gave to that phrase. And so it can be read, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like ones becoming strong. Now, while John's message gave the signal to people who are needing it, God's voice gave the people strength. And so it came to that moment where I had to leave my mom's house and just so happened I had to fill my tank again and as I started to pump right when near the end I heard hey pump number four how are you and I yelled awesome I'm awesome thank you and the voice said all right that was it I was smiling of course there was of course a person there at the next pump who gave me a look but that did not matter because I was in a great mood for the trip home because I wanted to hear that voice, I needed to hear that voice, and I got it. When we want and need God's voice, remember that God's voice is never silent. It is never on mute. We just need to hear. And sometimes hearing God is to feel God through the hug of a loved one. Sometimes hearing God is to see God through the loving acts of people who care for the sick, the poor, the needy, the lost. Or in our case, the foster families, the children, the wonderful residents at Trinity Grove. Sometimes hearing God is to feel God when he comes and welcomes us to his table. Where he gives us his body and blood as signs, as the hug that says to us, all is forgiven. You are still mine. And I will always talk to you. Amen and thanks be to God.